just 50 years ago, I sat where you're sitting. Uh, I was a student at Whittier, and uh, I graduated in 66, and I went to law school back east, uh, which was a huge cultural shock for me. I went to Harvard. Uh, and then I became a White House fellow right out of Harvard. Uh, with Nixon. Nixon was elected, and, and uh, there weren't any other people who applied for the fellowship uh, that had gone to Whittier College and could read. So I could do both, <laughs> and uh, I applied, and so I was a White House fellow. And then uh, I spent five years on the Nixon Ford White House staff, and I did policy uh, planning uh, for the domestic council, the counterpart of the National Security Council on uh, uh, policy issues of importance to the president. Uh, and, and then after the presidency ended, uh, I, for 40 years, have arranged and hosted reunions of the Nixon Ford policy planning staff, the folks who really govern, not the folks who campaign. I'm no good at campaigning, but the folks who really dealt with national problems. Uh, so I've arranged those uh, reunions for 40 years in Washington. Uh, it includes people that, depending on your uh, political persuasion, you may like or not like, but uh, David Gergen and Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney uh, and Diane Sawyer and Pat Buchanan and uh, uh, Colin Powell uh, and, and a, a number of other people, we were all kids together on the Nixon's White House staff. And we get back together and talk about talk about issues once a year. We're the only White House staff that does that. Uh, others have occasional reunions, but nobody else does it every year. And then finally, because I don't have anything else to do, for the past three years, I've arranged and produced 25 Nixon legacy forms, where we get some of these people who we used to work with on any, any particular topic, put them in front of a video camera, and talk about what we did on welfare reform, or what we tried to do in education, or what, what with the opening to China, or something else, like with, with Dick Solomon. Dick was in one of our, our programs earlier, who was here uh, just, just last week. Uh, so I, I swam with the sharks, and I dwell in that arena. And, and we, when I ran into Eric, at a, uh, I think it was a, after a football game or something, right, so. and, and uh, we started talking about this article that he's assigned. And I find it so intriguing that we thought we would talk about it in front of in front of this class. And I understand you've been studying the election, so this this is key. Uh, uh, first, whether what it is, you know, whether you read the assignment or not, and then whether it makes sense, and whether you can predict with it. And that's the fun discussion we're going to have. Faith in the creative potential of men in office holds center stage in American constitutional design. And there it wrestles with fear of the degenerative propensities of Republican institutions. The contest is especially intense in the presidency. A bold celebration of the energy and independence of a unitary executive, the office charges its incumbents with great responsibility for political leadership and then circumscribes them in a host of, contri of contrivances designed to control their ambition and to stave off the dread forces of disruption. Provisions for vigorous action press uncertainly against provisions for stabilizing the politics of the republic. That's a hell of an open, you know, when, you, when you're writing about the presidency. But there's this huge tension within the office, the most powerful guy in the world, and, and he really doesn't have much going for him except what Teddy Roosevelt called the bully pulpit. He can focus attention, focus public attention, but he can't command. It's very, very hard for him to make things happen. Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, what he's saying here is, is our constitutional system, the 18th century Republican form of government that we have of limited government, checks and balances, uh, separation of powers. So the president, despite, you know, people, that, as we saw in the 2008 election, folks invest all this hope and, and you, know, you know, good wishes into the president, but the president is circumscribed by these institutions to other branches of government. Uh, one of the branches has two houses that aren't even often in the same, you know, in the same party. Uh, the president can't do anything, essentially, without the help of these other branches. And that's not how we talk about the president, is, is I think what Skaran says. That's not how we think about the president. Um, 
but it is a true fact that our president is limited by the Constitution and by, the, by these other branches. And so it's very interesting. What Skoranek wants to talk about is, why do some presidents do so well and other presidents struggle so much? Destined for failure. Right. And he says, is it, you know, is it that they're just bad people, they just didn't try hard, or, or is it something about the institutional structure that they inherit? <coughs> and this is, this is what's called an institutional model for understanding politics that says that the, the institutional structure you inherit is important to understanding your success or failure. And so Skoranek puts forward his, his uh, four, uh, four block model that says there's sort of two ways that presidents come into power and the regime that they inherit has two different structures as well. So, he asks right? two questions and classifies all presidents accordingly. I could put Skoranek in, in context. Before Skoranek, there was a guy named Newstead, Richard Newstead, right. and he wrote a book on, on how you analyze the presidency. And he said, forget every president before Franklin Roosevelt. They don't count. They didn't face comparable issues. We start the modern presidency with Roosevelt. And Skoranek comes along and he says, nonsense. They were all faced the same kinds of problems. And you can classify them if you just ask two questions. When the guy ran, guys so far, when the guy ran, did he run in opposition to the ruling regime, the status quo? Or did he run in support of it? So was he opposed to the status quo? Or was he affiliated? That's his first question. And his second question, was the status quo, the ruling regime, which he leaves slightly undefined, was the ruling regime vulnerable? Had it run out of answers? Had it lived its life? Had the, the pendulum was starting to swing? Or was it resilient? And those are the, the two down here. And you get four, four possibilities. You get four squares. And he puts all the presidents in the four squares. And there's some, he, he says, well, th th these are exceptions. We don't have to deal with them. But, but that's what he does. And we'll go to the first right. one. Well, and just before we do this, this is really power. If, if this model is explanatory, it's really powerful. Because, you know, like what Newstad used to say, you disregard everybody else and you only look at the modern presidency, right? He says everybody since FDR. If Skoranek's model helps us to understand the success or failures of presidents with just these two questions, that would, that, that would be a very attractive thing. It would be a very powerful thing. Easy to understand. Right. So, Easy on the exam. Right. There you go. Right. <laughs> so, you know, let's walk through the four and we'll talk about some of the presidents in each of them. All right. So, politics of the reconstruction. This is when a president comes to power opposed to a vulnerable regime. And Skoranek says, this is, this is, you know, this is the this place is, to be. Yeah. <laughs> this is what the office was designed for. The presidency is an agent, <coughs> an agent of change. And the president grabs the problem, which is vulnerable, which needs a new solution, and arrests it into a new direction. And that's classic leadership, and our greatest presidents came to office under those circumstances. And the greatest presidents are? Well, they, oh, they're they're Jefferson, right. Jackson, Lincoln, FDR. FDR, and you've left off Reagan. Well, yeah. but, that's true. But Skoranek, Skoranek. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You're, you'll get points. But, but his whole point, and he doesn't say these folks succeeded beyond our greatest imagination, that, that their answers were wonderful. You know, we, we had civil wars and we had all these other problems. But his point is, when we look for pure presidential leadership, these are the folks who had it. And he, they didn't have it because they were tall and handsome and articulate. They had it because they ran as an agent of change, and change was necessary. Okay? Next. So, well, let's look at, let's just real, uh, Abraham Lincoln, for example, right? He is opposed to the system of slavery, the, the, the dominant, you know, powers that had been, uh, the majority supported slavery. Uh, when he runs, he's opposed to it. The system's vulnerable. I mean, this, you know, slavery is not going to be able to continue. There's, you know, bleeding Kansas and all these problems that are going on in the country. Um, because he's opposed to a vulnerable system, he's able to, you know, 
generate whole brand new paradigms that don't... And, and, Word, that didn't exist before yeah. his campaign. And Skoranek says sometimes these things don't even answer the problems of the day, but because they're so transformative that they create new problems and you don't have to worry about the old problems because now the whole system has changed <laughs> fundamentally. I think FDR is a good example of that where the, you know, FDR comes in opposed to Hoover and that not doing anything about the Great Depression. Right? The Great Depression laid bare uh, the problems with the status quo showed that the system was vulnerable. Hoover's greatest attribute as president for three years going into the depression was we had to balance the budget. Right. I mean, <laughs> and raise tariffs. Yeah. Those were the two. Yeah. It really worked. Right. And no money, no cash payments right. no to help. the poor. No help. Right? That was Hoover's thing. So FDR comes in and completely reinvents. Some people would say, look, he didn't really solve the Great Depression. Nope. But he, he did change the country completely, right? And yes. so that's what Skoranek says. It's not even that they have to address the problems, but they have this opportunity to reinvent the country in some ways. Reagan's another one that comes in, you know, uh, Carter, uh, was, Carter was malaise. The Democrats had controlled the government for years, and, and their, their answers to the, to the country's problems weren't working. Reagan comes in and reinvents government, changes, although that's a gore thing. He, he says, we're, no, 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 it's, it's we, 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 we have a country we believe in, the shining city on the hill, right. respect for the military, uh, huge changes uh, because of Reagan's right. uh, uh, interest in, in, in changing the status quo. Right. And the Cold War. Right. Well, what determines if, um, if I guess the regime is technically vulnerable or resilient? I mean, is that an empirical observation, or is that something that... Interesting you should ask, because Skoranek doesn't go into that in great detail. We'll, we'll give you the answer after we've done the square. Right. Okay. But, okay. but it is a good question to ask. Yeah, what, what does he mean by vulnerable? What does he mean by resilient? Is yeah. that self-evident at the time? It's a good, good question. Okay. And it's only, it's, it's only self-evident afterwards. Okay. So, right? right. This Let's is go where the they're affiliated with a vulnerable system. Not something that sounds like a very pleasant place to be, right? They're running in support of a system that's dying, okay? <laughs> right. uh, presiding over the demise of, uh, of uh, America. Right. Uh, and these folks aren't highly thought of. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they're precursors of disaster. They're, they're, uh, they're, it's, it's, uh, it's not a despised presidency, but it's seen as a failed presidency. Right. Carter, if, if you right. talk to your folks, you, uh, uh, Carter's not one of our more respected recent presidents. Democrat that he is. In terms of what he did, I mean, he's actually respected for what he's done since the presidency. But I think, you know, one of the things that they, uh, he talks about is oftentimes these guys aren't even really the flag carrier for their party. The Carter doesn't come in as a typical Democrat, right? He's a Southern right. governor, uh, you know, more, not much more religious. Not a natural succession at all. Yeah, not a natural succession. Not who the Democrats would have picked. In fact, uh, Kennedy would have probably been a more quintessential Democrat to run in 76. He, just, he did, but he, he wasn't could, able to he, get he the nomination. Drive. Right, know. yeah, if he could drive, right? Be able to drive. But, but, but one of the things that Skorana talks about is that doesn't seem to matter. Right, that they're sort of not your typical Democrat or not your typical affiliated party member. They still are drugged down by the fact that they're affiliated to a vulnerable system. They can, they're not able to give this, you know. Wrong, this, could be the right guy, wrong time. Right, His right, point exactly. is they aren't the right guy because the right guy won't, won't step forward right. because it's the wrong time. Right. And it's just your, your uh, this happens with stocks too. If you're a little early or a little late, you lose money. Right. Well, and I think Hoover raises this question that's related to when is the system vulnerable. Hoover in 28, uh, you know, beats uh, Smith. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks say if the, if the Democrats hadn't nominated a Catholic in, that, in 28, that they probably would have won because the, the Democrats made huge gains in the houses and things like that. But imagine the situation that it would have been if the stock market crashes while... Uh, a Smith or a Democrat is in president place. Yeah. would have muddled this whole vulnerable and resilient. And, and, and the, the, the crash, we, we just went past the whatever the anniversary was right. of, of the Black, Black Friday or whatever. <laughs> and Hoover had been in office a very short time. I mean, a very, very short time. It, you, you can't blame. With, with Bush, you, you can mount an argument right. that, that he, he and his party were at fault. You can't do that with Hoover. He just happened to be there 
and then he was there for three years while it just got worse and worse and right. worse. But he didn't. He couldn't be said to have caused the crash. Right. right. <clears throat> um, okay. So that's disjunction. Um, articulation is when you're affiliated with a resilient uh, regime. This sounds like a great place to be, right? But, yeah. But if you look at the names, it's not. In fact, he says this is the most common that this president would step down and not even seek re-election. And it's right. happened the most often with this right. particular presidency. And, and, and the problem is they follow a great leader. Right. And when you follow, the expectation is you can achieve perfection. You can really bring all the answers home. And you can't. So these are standard bearers. These are party people right. put into place. And the, the regime is still strong, but it doesn't meet expectations because the expectations have been raised too high. So... It's a self-selected group of people who most often don't stand for re-election. He says that presidents that are, that are successful shake things up, right? Well, it's hard to shake things up when your party controls stuff. Because right. you're shaking them up, right? And they don't like that. You're not an agent of change. And <laughs> right. it, it, again, his whole point is the, 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 these checks and balances, everything else we've done to build the office of the presidency, works best if you're an agent for change. Right. This is the fun one. Right. What if you ran opposed to the regime and you thought the regime was vulnerable and the empire strikes back? What if you're wrong? These are the failed presidencies. Uh, Tyler, where the first articles of impeachment were, uh, were drafted, I read the article on the way out the plane, uh, Andrew Johnson, who was impeached but not convicted by one vote. Woodrow Wilson, who was just, I mean, he, they, they thought he was only four years, and then he was just uh, uh, ruined over the treaty. They wouldn't, right. they wouldn't approve the Treaty of Versailles. Yep. And uh, you may remember Richard Nixon, but Richard Nixon was driven from office. And to some extent, here we, here we have Bill Clinton, but it, it, it's, an, it's an interesting question. We've, we've gone beyond Skoranek, because Skoranek has two books. One is up to uh, Bush one, and then he does a subsequent book on the next four, but he doesn't have as good a description of, of how the, the four square works. But you could say, I mean, Clinton got impeached too, because the Republicans controlled both houses. So this is the worst place to be, an agent of change, elected to cause change, and the country's not ready for change, the, uh, the ruling... Uh, the organization, the regime is stronger than you thought. And we come back now to your question. Right. The best proxy for the ruling regime is control of the House of Representatives. Skronik doesn't say that. This is Shepard on Skronik. Uh, but, you know, that's elected everywhere. That's really elected two years, every two years, a, a full, full, complete re-election. And that's said to reflect really the views of the people in 435 people. So if you are president and you don't have the House, you're, you're, you're fighting what some would, would say is the regime. And remember the Speaker of the House, third in line to become president. It's just he's right after the vice president. Right. So, well, you know, I wrote here, uniquely American. This is a really interesting box because most countries this wouldn't happen. Can't happen. It can't happen. If, if you think of the parliamentary systems where the, where the executive branch is essentially elected by the majority <coughs> of the parliament, right? The executive branch elected by the majority of parliament. That executive branch, the prime minister, only serves as long as they enjoy the support from the majority, right? We talked about this, that one of the things about PR systems is they can be uh, more, uh, less stable because as soon as the prime minister loses the support of the majority, even on just one issue, right, he loses they, a they, key vote. They could call. They could need, call, need for the, call for the call for the, the to, to test to see if the government to see if he has majority support. And if he fails that vote, there's a new election. So right. a parliamentary system bans the existence of this box. Right. You would never have a president or an executive power that doesn't have the, the essentially the blessings of the of the other branch sure. of government. In the United States, because they're separate, uh, elected separately, the president serves four years no matter what happens to the House. Right? And so it, it becomes oftentimes that the House 
either while the president's in office or, or sort of right as they take office, goes to the other party. This puts up this situation, and what Skoranek predicts uh, is that, you know, it's not that big a surprise that Nixon, that there were, you know, that there were impeachment papers drawn up for Nixon, because Nixon didn't control the House. The House was run by the, by the Democrats and had been for a long time, yep. and the Senate, right? Um, and Bill Clinton, uh, when he takes office, the Democrats uh, control, control, but he loses in his, in, after, in his first midterm, he loses the majority. The, the, of the uh, House after 40 years. Right, right, 40 I mean, years. And so this looks a lot like uh, what he thought was vulnerable. He runs saying, you know, these people yep. aren't answering our questions, yep. and, and, and they get, you know, they gave defeats, him the presidency. Defeats, uh, uh, Bush won. Right, he gets the presidency, but he loses the House very quickly. So this system, this Republican system, is resilient. Um, they, they're on the rise, you know, they, they uh, uh, huge gains in, in sufficiently in, opposed to change that they won the election. Right, right. I mean, it was it was uh, Hillary Care. Right. It wasn't Obamacare. Uh, Clinton devoted his wife, a very capable woman, to a a huge change in health care, and the American public rejected it uh, resoundingly. And control of the House. Did the Senate change that election or uh, it, it got closer. I don't think it was yeah. until the next so that it switched. When, but when Clinton is reelected. Right. In '96, mm -hmm. both houses of Congress are against him, and Skoranek is known to have said he's going to be impeached. This is an untenable position for any president. He's going to be impeached, and you can see why. We'll, we'll get to this. We're going to get to a discussion. In a if you don't control either house, there's nobody to defend you when you come under attack. There's withering attack from both houses, and the minority in, in, in each can't generate <clears throat> the publicity and everything else to protect you. And the other thing, when you're a lame duck, when you've been reelected, you're never going to run again, and the party is not willing to go over the cliff with you. They're not willing to defend your point of view. Uh, why should I go out and fight on some issue, controversial issue, when I mean, he thinks he's got an answer, but he's not running for election again, and I am. And so the, the party starts to desert you. you the, the minute you're a lame duck, power starts flowing away. You've, just, you've seen this with Bush, too, if you read the newspaper. Uh, uh, he's he's reelected. He says, I'm going to devote all this uh, uh, political capital to reforming Social Security. And he fails. And then in 2006, they lose both houses. Both the Senate and, and the, uh, and, and the uh, Congress went Democratic. And Bush couldn't have fixed a traffic ticket his last two years. I mean, it was a, he wasn't impeached, but it was a failed presidency. Right. Well, that, that's actually an interesting question. I don't think we usually get to this, but usually we talk about where would you put Obama. Absolutely. And I think that's where we should go. But I think you just raised the question, where would we put George W. Bush? And I haven't really thought about it, so, so, I, so I'm sort of on the fly, but um, it seems like... Well, he ran opposed because he was uh, fighting Clinton. Right. And, and if, 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 not that you were born then, but Clinton was in total disrepute, disrepute when he was driven from office. I mean, completed the terms, but he ran opposed. I would right. say he was an agent of change. Right. Uh, uh, very, very, very close election. You know, we didn't know for three weeks until yeah, the Supreme what was Court the final, told us. It was five and four, right? The well, it was. Unfortunately, <laughs> the five didn't pick Al Gore, so, you know, yeah. nobody since has said, well, shoot, if we had Al Gore, it would really be a good chance. But it, the regime, the, the umpire struck back in 2006. They, they ran the table. Democrats won every close seat in the Senate. It, it wasn't thought to be possible right. to lose, but there were six or seven seats, just like there are today, right. that were really close, and they won every single one of them. Right. Not a single incumbent Democrat lost. And, and yes, six or seven Republicans are open seats, right. I mean, and, right. and, and that's a seat change. Right. So I would, put him, I would put him here, and I would classify it as a, uh, as a failed presidency. Okay. Hi there. Politics of three Welcome. Ocean. How are you, Jack? Good to see you. Good you to too. See you. Um, all right. Uh, I mean, I think I think that probably. Yeah. Let's go to Obama. Okay. I, uh, yeah. Well, I had an opinion that 
I often thought that Bush fell into the affiliated resilient category because he was part, he represented the regime that was still in place, that was ruled by the Republicans, and Clinton just sort of just represented the presidency, and that was only, and Clinton was just facing the regime at the time. We and, lost the Senate in 2000. When the was it fifty fifty? You know, yeah, one guy switched. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy from oh. some guy from New England. Specter. No, that was later. Oh, that's uh, yeah, yeah, right. the, uh, yeah. He switched after the election. Uh, was the guy from Vermont or something? Uh, yeah, that guy. Lieberman. No, no uh, Lieberman. Uh, uh, this Very is before. This is this is in the year two thousand. Yeah, not Sanders. Uh, Very Sanders. Gee whiz. Davies, something like that. Yeah. He, he lost next time out. Right, I can't think of his name. Uh, but we lost yeah. control of the Senate. Yeah. Even so, he still he articulated a vision, yeah. But he was articulating the vision for the for the affiliated regime at the time, even if the Senate was still there. Well, it, it, it's entirely possible you're right. But he's coming in after eight years of Clinton. Uh, uh, he's running on a different platform from Clinton's. Uh, uh, I would tell you that Al Gore was the affiliated guy. I'm going to take what Clinton did, I've been his vice president, I'm going to continue that. And, and Bush came in, you know, out of uh, Texas, of all places, mm -hmm. uh, having run the Texas Rangers, uh, the, the football team, what better qualification to be a baseball soccer. That's why they're interchangeable if you're going to be president. Uh, uh, and and uh, one largely on the strength of his name and name recognition. Uh, uh, an incredible leg up in today's politics. Um, but I, I mean, I think your point raises a good question. He, you know, he was opposed to Clinton. The question is whether or not the, the regime was vulnerable or resilient, because I think, um, you know, uh, Bush didn't, didn't you know, win that convincingly in 2000, but in 2002, there was this little event that happened in 2001. Absolutely, yeah. That caused yeah, a massive uh, payback spike in Republicans. He won uh, 2002 uh, the, the midterms yeah, in 2002. And, which and in 2004, historic. he won the election. So, so I think during that time, and this is, this is one of the issues that I have with Skoranek, is when do you say that he's, whether it's vulnerable or resilient, or whether yeah. he's opposed or affiliated, because... For that moment, when 2002 and 2004, he looks like affiliated resilient, and, and it looks like he's boxed yeah. in by articulation. He can't really do anything because they control the both houses, yep. and yep. so he looks like one of these articulation presidents. And then in 06, in 06 he boom. loses the house. This may be that either either he's affiliated and it's vulnerable, uh, which he's disjunction, or like what you said, so he's opposed to resilient. You're, you're right until 06. Right, yeah. Right. And then, yeah. then uh, right. and, and again, in a parliamentary system, the government would have fallen. Right. The they morning decide. after 06. Remember, he fires Rumsfeld. Right. Uh, uh, we're in an unpopular war. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, who was uh, every girl's dream, goes down. Uh, uh, and, and, and Bush, the. the Wait, there were seven all of, of, all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the gray, the, the blue, blue gray hair. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the, the, there were, with the new Democratic control of both houses of Congress, 300 separate investigations mm. right. of, of, of his presidency. And, and, and what they're doing, they're, they're softening up the electorate for the next election. They're just getting a head start on 08. That's what that that's what Congress was doing. Right, right. But but let's go let's go to Obama for the okay. for, for the fun of it. Uh, what do you think? What do you think? He he's clearly an agent of change. I mean he is opposed to the ruling regime, and almost everybody would agree the regime was vulnerable. Or it looked vulnerable. Look, look, well, yeah, but at the moment of, of election. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, crashing markets, right. you know, all kinds of issues, much like the Great Depression. And Only the comes, timing's differently. He different, comes right? in, he's, he's coronated uh, uh, with massive control of both houses. I mean, a veto proof majority in the Senate. He did not have 60 votes in the Senate when 59. he was coronated. He didn't, no, he didn't even have 59. 58? Yeah, He's 58, yeah. maybe. All right, 58. Well, he gets them. He's got some numbers, he and he does them. for about 60 days or so. He had 60 votes. Okay. 
but but uh, a, a, a big win. I mean, that's you know, no, I'm not trying Huge to argue win. that. I'm just saying, you know, 60 days in the Senate, that's like, you could what, do one thing, right? <laughs> so anyway. Got to be Yeah, but I mean, he did one thing, Obamacare. Yes, he anyway. certainly did. By and so so uh, he, clearly Obama comes in, in the beginning. looks he's a lot right. like he's going to be a reconstruction. And he's right? Lincoln and Washington put together. And FDR. You know, this is really, yeah. Right. Anybody you want. But he, little Reagan, too. Right, in. right, sure. Okay. And Even then, through some of Reagan and, 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 and promising to be above partisanship, uh, a, 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 new, a new era, and reasonable people, ordinary thinking Americans voted for him. Yeah, astonishing. And then he, and he, and, and he, he, he passes Obamacare, but it's vicious. It's just vicious. Uh, uh, and you get the out-year elections, <coughs> and, and the Tea Party out of nowhere, you know, these rampaging, crazy people. And they show up at all the, the, the uh, meetings. And, you know, what you do if you're in Congress, you've got to go home every two years to get, get elected. So you have town hall meetings where you tell people how good you are. And these Tea Party people started showing up complaining about what he was trying to pass in Obamacare. And they stopped having town hall meetings. Right. I mean, it was, you just couldn't put it, there were too many people who were upset, and it wasn't one crazy person, you know, asking questions from the back of the room. You, could, you couldn't control the crowd. And they, and they got scared, and you've got a level of reactive, reactionary enthusiasm that changed the House of Representatives, and it was meant to. And you have Scott Brown in Massachusetts, right. who, the, the, the pickup truck driver, who runs on his, his platform is very simple. I will, I will, I will be the 60th vote, and I will, I will not vote for Obamacare. And they can't get it through without me. And Ted Kennedy's seat goes to Scott Brown. So you could say that he ends up down here as we go into this next election, and we don't know. We don't know about the regime. We don't know how the people feel, because right. we don't trust the polls, and we only talk to our friends. So we're all positive we're right, and we can't both be right. You know, possibly your professor is wrong. Well, and I mean, there's a few other places. No, that's not. There's a few other places that Obama might fall. I mean, Absolutely. This is good. Think this about this. Um, some folks say, you know, Obama. On, on one reading of Obama is that he was horribly opposed to the status quo, but a lot of folks say, "Look, you know, his Treasury Secretary is the status quo." I mean, he's number the, three guy, number, the tarp and everything. He was he was Bush's guy, right? And he was also a Goldman Sachs executive, and right? he didn't pay his taxes, right? Right. So, I didn't know about that, but so I don't, like, here's a guy of the establishment. Can we spend a second on it? <laughs> sure. He works for the World Bank, and. If you work for the World Bank, which is an international institution, they don't take out for Social Security. And Social Security is 6.2% of your, of your money that's taxed. Okay? And he didn't pay. You're supposed to, if well, you first 100,000 is taxed. Yeah, first 100,000 is taxed at 6.2%. And, and if you work for an international institution in the United States, you're supposed to pay that voluntarily. And for eight years, he just forgot. <laughs> so we got this guy up to be Secretary of the Treasury. And he's cheated on his taxes. I mean, you know, he didn't just forget yeah, yeah. for eight years. He's cheated. Right. And, and he should have fallen. Shouldn't have been confirmable. Right. And the word was out to Republicans and to Democrats, there wasn't anybody else willing to, to be take the job. Secretary of the Treasury <laughs> in the midst of this terrible downturn. And whoever took it was going to get ruined. Yeah. So he... But, but then on, on the, 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 the Secretary of Defense, <laughs> the Secretary of Defense is held over. Right. Tom right. Gates. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. so Obama's this great agent of change, but... But it's possible that he's affiliated with this vulnerable system. I mean, he does a lot to, to, to continue Bush policies to, you know, the TARP. Uh, was yeah, tarp started was under started under Bush yeah. and, and <clears throat> finished under him. The auto bailout, the first checks were cut by Bush. Yep. He finishes writing those. So in a lot of ways, he takes steps to prop up this vulnerable system. So some folks say, even though he is a Democrat, and so that's somewhat confusing, that there is a way to read it that maybe he's more like Bush than you would expect. Right. 
and also more like a disjunction president than than a, re a reconstruction president. And then I'm going to take credit for this because it was uh, it was Eric's idea last time. Right. He could say he was affiliated uh, b because the Democrats took control in 06 of both houses so dramatically, right. and he was merely an extension of that. Yeah. That he wasn't that much of an agent of change. Right. So you could you could argue that he's in any one of those boxes. Right. Right. We won't really know till afterwards. We won't really know right. till we see the next election, and maybe the uh, maybe the, the, the midterms, midterms well. depending on, on whether he went or not. The midterms after that. Right. But but think about it. If Obama's in preemption, right? If Obama's opposed to what turns out to be a resilient system. Right. I mean, let's say the Republicans make gains, but he narrowly wins the White House again. Yeah. But the but the Republicans hold the House and make gains in the Senate as they were planned to do. It, it's not looking like they're going to make gains now. But at one point they talked about really there right. was a good chance yeah. that they would take over the Senate. If they would have done both those things, there's almost a certainty that Obama would be. At least there would be hearings awkward, about impeachment in an awkward, awkward position, position to put in him an on. Awkward position. Right? See, again, he'd be a lame duck. From the power, first would, day. power would move away from him. And if the Republicans gained the Senate, and the reason why it was so promising at one point, doesn't look good now. It, so the Republicans right. should have been able. Right. But, this is six the years people. after the 06 sweep. Yes. And so all of those senators, Democratic senators, that did really well in 2006 are up for election. So what he just said, there's 33 seats up for election in the Senate, but something like 25 of those are held by Democrats. So the Democrats have a lot more seats to defend. Okay. This is why they thought that the Republicans would have a good chance. One of the issues was the Tea Party. Absolutely. That the, that the Republican Senate nominees are very conservative. Tea Party, like Indiana is one good example, where they, in the primary, in the Republican primary, the Tea Party challenged and defeated a sitting senator, Richard Luger, one of the you know long would have had senator. re-election in the yeah would have eighty would have, years old. Would, we wouldn't even be talking about the race yep. because he would have won it no, yep. with no trouble. Wouldn't even have to raise money. He lost in the primary because he was seen as too moderate because of his work on uh, nuclear disarmament. Hey, if you're if you're a minority of a minority, the Republican Party is a minority in this country, and if you're Tea Party, and and, and you're a minority of a minority, but you dominate the primary or one in ten turns out, you can ruin the party because you want to be so pure. And pure doesn't win elections. Now, the, 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 the thing we're going back and forth on in, 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 in the ruling regime, we would tell you, the people who are right and true and patriotic Americans, would tell you that America is a center-right country, that it doesn't like dramatic change and it's it willing to move slowly and evolve. And that the current president is ruling from a, 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 the left side of the Democratic Party, and that won't that won't hold because the regime isn't isn't eager to go that far. And we'll see. That's what right. elections are for. Right, right. And that's sort of you know, if the economy continues to suffer, that's going to look like a vulnerable regime because this you know the idea is whether or not, and the way Skoranek talks about this is whether or not it's answering the problems of the day. And that's hard to sort of quantify with any kind of certainty, but you can, you can bet that a uh, humming economy, no matter what, is going to be seen as a resilient regime, oh, yeah. right? Oh, so, yeah. so a lot of this has to do with the economy. Um, let's see what else do we have. What about Obama? Do you want to do this last slide? Yeah, let's okay. go to the last slide. Okay. Okay. Well, then we'll see what the people think All right. about the election. Uh, you got to take this with a grain of salt. This is my slide. And what we've done is take the red state, blue state, you know, the red states are Republican and the blue states are Democratic, and show it on the House and the Senate and control the presidency. So if it's blue, the Democrats control the Senate, Democrats control the House, and then we go up and we see what happened over time. And this is uh, 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 all the way back from Roosevelt's dominance of the presidency. And I originally did this to show what happened to Nixon because of my views and my writings. And I maintain, see, when he was Eisenhower's vice president, Eisenhower was not a political president. He could have been elected if he were Democrat. He was a war hero. And but the they didn't even know his policy. Po he, yeah, he didn't, he didn't, military people frequently don't, don't register or vote. 
uh, and they think that they should serve whomever's in, in uh, office. So Nixon was a huge partisan while he was vice president because Eisenhower was not. And, and when you get up to here, <clears throat> if you were looking to take Nixon out, you could say, it's just this guy. We get rid of this guy and we go back to blue dominance, which is the natural way of things. And we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we, it just, it's the personality of Richard Nixon we have to remove. But in fact, Nixon is a beachhead for pretty interesting control of the executive branch. And under Reagan, for the first time since Eisenhower was first elected, the Republicans get control of the Senate. I mean, Reagan was elected in 1980 and swept into office with him. The, 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 almost the reverse of 06. Right. Really, really prominent Democratic senators fell like, like a matchsticks. And, and then uh, he loses it. Again, that's the economy. Right, right. well, what? Yeah. double yeah. Yeah. Are inflation. you better off today than you were four years ago? When, when that took out Jimmy... a lot of senators, yeah. and congressmen, and presidents. And then you get, and we're going to go back through the bottom line, which is key. Then, then, then you get the return to normalcy. And then Clinton loses, loses big time, gets impeached. And then this is where we were talking about who controlled. Uh, and I, I will get his name, but he was a Vermont senator who switched. Seth, Jeff Sessions? No, no that's uh, Alabama. Oh, yeah, yeah. What uh, was his name? Mm. We cut their dairy subsidies, I'll tell you that. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and then you come up to here, see, and this is the sign of, of uh, resilience of the opposite regime, and we don't know what's going to happen next. But the slide shows, this is what's so interesting. Each and every time in my lifetime, which is the key because I did the slide, each and every time a lame duck president faced a totally hostile Congress, impeachment or virtual impeachment followed. Nixon has Watergate. Uh, Reagan, <clears throat> Reagan was known as the uh, Teflon president. Right. Nothing affected him until he lost control of the Senate, and then we get the Iran-Contra affair. And, and, and Roosevelt, uh, uh, Reagan's beaten up quite badly. Right. Because they're and, Senate hearings. They're not just some kooky House guy right. talking and, that. Now it's Senate. And, and there's no the protection from the House. Right. So all the dominant leadership on the other side is dead against you. Clinton gets reelected because we put up Bob Dole. <laughs> Clinton gets reelected. And Whitewater follows. You know, it's Monica Lewinsky too, but, but it was, it was uh, a trample time on, on Bill. And he, he avoids conviction in the Senate right. by relatively few votes. Yeah, maybe four, three or four. Well, of course, all inspectors voted, thirds, right. not, not proven. Right. And then we get to Bush, and we said plain and U.S., because Bush loses control of both houses in 06. The Valerie Plain affair comes up, which is hard to follow, because uh, somebody outed a CIA operative, and it turns out to be <clears throat> Richard Armitage, the Under Secretary of State, and the prosecutor knows who it is from the first two days, but doesn't shut down his prosecution, and then picks on this guy because uh, Scooter Libby, who was Vice President and Chief of Staff, because his answer to FBI investigation might not have been totally uh, totally honest. Might have been. Uh, is that is that, a, is that against the law? Yeah, lying to lying oh, to okay, the FBI. I wasn't yeah, sure. We all do. If you've ever had an FBI show up. First thing you do is you deny. You <laughs> deny everything. Okay. Then you go see your lawyer and he says, geez, what a good job. Why did you job. say that? Yeah, oh, no comment. A, boy, right. are you in trouble. That's what they did to Martha Stewart. Right, right. Martha Stewart, you know, twinkle toes on the TV and uh, the perfect housewife. And, and uh, uh, some friend tells her about some stock that isn't going to get its FDA approval, so the, the, the drug is going to go down. And she, she sells... sells and they go after her because she's public. And then it turns out she didn't break the law because she was, it was not inside information that she was told. She, wasn't, she didn't qualify for the way the statute was drafted. So they got her on denying a criminal act she, that wasn't criminal. Well, she lied to them saying she, that she had a cell. Uh, cell she had a different reason for selling. She, she had yeah. a call. Well, absolutely. Any time it reaches absolutely. this, uh, cell. Then she called her lawyer. Right. Yeah. And the lawyer she called was her son-in-law. Oops, yeah, never a good one. And then the other part, the other part was uh, 
the replacement of the eight United States attorneys. That's what it says U.S. Mm -hmm. used to say U.S. attorneys. Uh, it was de deemed political that, that Bush had, had replaced these attorneys. Right. And they serve, the United States attorneys, there are, there are 94 U United States attorneys, they serve at the pleasure of the president. They are the president's personal representative mm -hmm. in each of the federal court districts. And he has every right in the world to fire them for whatever reason. But the memos from the White House to the Department of Justice were difficult to justify. Right. Difficult well, to justify. Well, they had that woman that had gone to Liberty University that was in charge of the whole hiring of the attorneys that was very, very partisan. And anyway, yes. what, I, what I noticed about your little graph here is very interesting, is that the, the sort of the difference between Watergate and Whitewater, and not just the use of the word water, but and um, <laughs> Iran-Contra and the claim are our timing. Uh, Whitewater happens here uh, right off the bat after Clinton's re-elected. Yes. And plain doesn't happen until after he loses the after Bush loses the House in six. Same thing with the Iran Contra. It doesn't happen until Reagan loses the House and Senate at eighty six. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, they're re-elected without <coughs> right, without right. incident. Whereas Nixon's happens right, you know, upon re-election. Right of right upon during re the re-election essentially. <laughs> so that that two years makes it politically more, uh, wor um, you know, you get more bang for your buck for these people chasing after the president because they have four years to do it and it still matters because there's another election cycle. Yes. One of the things with Plame and one of the things with the Rand Contra was, you know, Reagan's not going to run again. It, it just sort of loses some oh, of the and, steam. And where what, I would, what I would tell you is going on. Good point. Yeah. There, it's just artillery softening up the electorate for the, the real election, which is the presidential election. They don't care. Now, you remember Vince Foster's suicide note ripped up in the bottom of the briefcase. This is a city that ruins people just for sport. Right. And the, the, uh, the fact you're ruining people's careers is really just a difficult byproduct because you're really fighting over the next election. And the fact Reagan wasn't going to run again, or Bush wasn't going to run, that didn't matter. Right. You were out to destroy every member of his cabinet. I mean, every, you, you, when, when you've got them down, you don't stop. I mean, you, uh, they put, <coughs> they convicted 60 people in Whitewater. I couldn't tell you what for. Right. Uh, and at least 60 people in Waterbay. Right. Uh, the others, they didn't get up to those numbers, but the investigations and the leaks and the press camping out on your doorstep. It, it, Washington, to some extent, is it's like a minuet, and you're on this, you know, here's the dance floor, and then welcome outsiders. Nobody grew up in Washington. So, oh, you just won the election. Come on in. Come on in. You know, isn't this fun? Here's the minuet. You make a misstep, and you're snatched from the dance floor. You may or may not go to jail, but you, you're ruined. I mean, it's a, it, it looks civilized, but it's not. It's not, because the parties are in... Uh, some disagreement. Well, the, the, just the end on that slide, because oh. my, my, my prediction, and you, you, know, you heard it here first, postulate for just a second that Obama wins re-election and the Democrats maintain control of the Senate, Republicans maintain control of the House. So you just get those colors extended. But then in 2014, because the problems won't be solved, most of these problems are <coughs> insoluble, so it's not a question of who, who solves them. In 2014, every president, every sixth year president, loses big in the out-year elections. And if Obama loses the Senate in 2014, then according to Shepard on Skoranek, we can't say it's Skoranek, but according to Shepard on Skoranek, he'll be impeached. Or At least virtually impeached, right? ruined, dragged through the dirt. It's a, a, something will come up. We'll, we'll get a hold of Eric Holder. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out what really happened in Libya. You bet we will. <laughs> you bet we will. And that, I mean, that some people say, well, you have to do something, right? Uh, Clinton had to, you know, mess around with Monica Lewinsky, or he never. I mean, no. the Whitewater wasn't even about Lewinsky. The majority of the of the you know digging wasn't focused on Lewinsky. That's just something that popped up through stuff, the stuff he yeah. done before he was right. pressed. Right. So they'll go digging. They don't yeah, have the, to have a real reason. The scandal doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's when, when Eric and I were first talking about Skoranek, he said, well, it's so cool because Skoranek says it doesn't matter who's president. It just matters about these four squares. And, and Skoranek taken to the ultimate, that's what, that's what he's suggesting. Well, when the scandals mount to take people down, the, the actual scandal doesn't matter. 
That's just a, a trolley passing on exactly. that you can you could take advantage of. Right. right. Well, that I mean that's one of these interesting things. Where Skoranek says, "Well, he'll be a peach." People say, "For what?" You know, they want to know. Well, what right. would he be a peach for? Skoranek says, "I don't know," but it here's why he'll be a peach. It doesn't yeah. matter. Right. How much this time? this How is time? interesting because I think it raises this question about the model. All right. So one uh, one thing I like to to tell you guys about this is Skoranek <coughs> uh, has has been on the forefront of develop of a new field in political science called APD, or American Political Development. And what these folks think is that institutions matter. And they're actually called historic institutionalists. They believe that history matters too, and that institutions matter. What does that mean? Well, it means like just what we walk through. That in order to understand why you know, anything works or doesn't work, or any, how, why some things happen and other things don't happen, you need to understand history, and you need to understand the institutional structure because that can help us understand why things happen. What, what makes the election so much fun is there are people on both sides who are extraordinarily talented to do this full time for money. Right? This is not amateur hour. Uh, and they both believe so strongly in their point of view that they want the next election. And they aren't willing to compromise today to solve the problem because they think the issue on their side is far more important in the next election. So it's almost regardless of who wins, right. gridlock continues because it's a tie. The House could go either way, the Senate could go either way, the presidency is going to be a point or so apart, and the real partisans on both sides are going to say, me compromise now? Wait till 2014. One thing that I think has changed is the election never stops. Right. I mean, for Obama didn't get a honeymoon. Uh -uh. He, no president gets a honeymoon. Bush didn't get a honeymoon. Nobody gets a honeymoon. I mean, you look at September 10th, the, the, the public opinion ratings of George W. Bush were in the tank. He mm -hmm. was, I mean, this, he hadn't even been in office but maybe just over a year. And already, uh, or I guess maybe, had he been, uh, no, maybe. Six months. So yeah, nine, really six or eight months. And he's already, you know, people are already giving up on him. Yep. That he's a failed presidency. Well, it? they wouldn't take the bumper stickers off. The, 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 the Bush <laughs> the sore loser thing. No, it was so close. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you counted fairly, we would have won. And acres of people was with uh, Al Gore. Right. Who was the? It was Gore. Lieberman. Yeah. Gore Lieberman yeah. uh, left the bumper so, stickers. Yeah. On. To the point where the, the Bush people started putting sore loserman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, <laughs> used, used to be, you won. Yeah. Maybe if you won. Right. Your opponent conceded, conceded. Right. and you tried to govern. Right, you were given this window yeah. to govern. Yeah, no more. No um, more. Campaign doesn't stop. stop. Right. And uh, that okay. raises interesting questions about this because, you know, it's like a fight every day. On whether, whether, it. whether it's going to be resilient tomorrow. It might be vulnerable today, but it's going to be resilient tomorrow. I mean, we don't, this is the thing, the fight never ends on this. Well, go. And that, that's some of, it's, you know, some of it is, at the end of the day, at the end of your presidency, you can look back and go, boy, that really was vulnerable, or that really was yes. resilient. Right. But in but the fight, here is the fall of war. it doesn't matter. Right. It, it really doesn't matter where you are.